We are thrilled to have with us from the disunited States of America, Jared Taylor of American Renaissance, an indefatigable force for truth about racial reality. We also have Dr. Jim Salem of the Australia First Party. Singularly, these men pose a serious threat to the denizens of uh, social order. Hence, Mr. Taylor and Amrin are being banned from every mainstream social media platform. Together, they pose a threat to the decline of Western civilization as we know it. Thank you both very much for joining us. Mr. Taylor, what is going on in America? It's falling apart before our very eyes. <laughs> That's a big question. What's wrong with the United States? Uh, we can go on for hours on that question. In the US, I would say that was a real turning point, May 25th of 2020. And this was an incident that should have passed utterly unperceived, both in the United States and elsewhere, but it resonated around the world. And that was the day that George Floyd uh, fought with the police, lay down on the sidewalk in Minneapolis and died. And this set off really a paroxysm of mass insanity in the United States. As you no doubt know, there was a tremendous amount of looting and burning. There had to be curfews called out in more than 200 cities in the United States to restore order. 30 of the United States called out the National Guard to maintain the peace. And this went on for months and months and months. And at the same time, this notion that whites are individually, personally responsible for the failures of blacks. This was something that had for the most part been cordoned off in universities and uh, other mentally unbalanced places. But it burst out into the United States at large and it appears to be actually believed by a certain number of people. So I would say that has been a very important turning point in the United States and everything turned for the worse beginning with that moment. Uh, the United States, in some respects, has been uh, disintegrating for quite a long time, uh, certainly in terms of race relations. Uh, some people plot it back to the 1950s, uh, some perhaps the 60s, uh, others uh, take it all the way back to the Declaration of Independence with that very unfortunate phrase, uh, all men are created equal, written by Thomas Jefferson, who certainly suffered no such illusions and who did not consider that any kind of expression of racial equality. But no, the United States has been racially disintegrating, if you will, for as long as it has been multiracial. And from the start, it's been multiracial. We started with a race problem because there were Indians here before we got here. And then not content with one race problem, we imported blacks and made them slaves, producing another even more serious race problem. And then in the 1960s, not content with that, we abolished what could have been called a white America policy. It wasn't as explicit as the policy in Australia. And we started importing people from all around the world. So now we have many people of practically every imaginable race under the sun, and the mixture has not been a healthy one. Now, there are other reasons for disintegration, hostility, and dissent in the United States. But I believe the most difficult social fault line in any country, and certainly in the United States, the one from which so many other fault lines are produced is this difference of race. Because race is a biological phenomenon. You can change your language, you can change your religion, you can change many things about you, but you are born a particular race and that you cannot change. And any nation that attempts to build a society on the notion that race can be made not to matter is going to come a cropper. So uh, yes, the divisions have been long-standing, but there was a kind of mass psychosis that swept the United States beginning May 25th when George Floyd died. No question about that. And Jim. Yes, uh, a lot of Australians have, of course, uh, followed the remarkable events in the United States with the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. And uh, I was going to ask you, and I'll slightly on our second take alter my question. 
this movement you said was spontaneous, although it had a definite basis. Uh, was it the case that this movement became manipulated very early in its run and started to take on different forms? Was it in some way an attempt to almost push inside the American establishment to guarantee some type of small L liberal outcome? There's no question that all of the institutions in the United States were extremely sympathetic to the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, in the United States, it is very, very difficult to criticize any explicitly black undertaking. About the only explicitly black undertaking you can criticize is organized gang warfare. Anything that has an even remotely political bent is considered an expression of certainly righteous indignation against alleged institutional racism, if not righteous rage against the wickedness of whites. So uh, here in the United States, we had such sustained looting and rioting that curfews had to be called in 200 cities and the National Guard had to be called out to restore order in 30 states. We've not had a disturbance of this kind in decades and never one that was this intense, this prolonged, and that was in effect encouraged by the media. This was a new change. Something that we had never seen before was when blacks previously rioted, they mainly rioted in their own neighborhoods. This time around, they didn't restrict themselves to rioting in their own neighborhoods. They rioted and looted in the swankiest retail addresses all across the United States. The Magnificent Mile in Chicago, Radio Dr Rodeo Drive in Hollywood, Fifth Avenue in New York City. This was a new development. And at the same time, we have never seen the police back off and behave in such a timid way as was done in this case. And then the third aspect was that all of this was coddled, not only by the media, but by many private corporations, many of which pledged to donate money to the Black Lives Matter movement. And then finally, and this to me, in some respects was the most significant. You probably know that many monuments all across the United States were torn down, monuments to white people, certainly monuments to Confederate heroes. This process has been going on for some time, but unlike in mass hysteria that occasionally will sweep a city or a neighborhood in the United States, and in this case swept the whole country, it wasn't just Confederates who had to come down. It was people like Abraham Lincoln, even uh, Junipero Serra, a certified saint of the Catholic Church because he allegedly mistreated Indians when he was converting them to Christianity. Even Ulysses S. Grant, who was a northern general during the Civil War, hundreds of monuments came down. But to me, the most significant victim of all this was none other than Christopher Columbus. No fewer than 39 statues and memorials to Christopher Columbus were either destroyed by mobs or taken down by cowardly authorities who feared that their little darlings might hurt themselves if they tried to pull down a statue on a 12 foot pedestal. This to me is very significant because what is the significance of Christopher Columbus? He was the first white man to show up in the Western hemisphere. He brought Western civilization, white people to the Americas, to North America, and to say, to somehow think that the grievances of blacks can be appropriately addressed by tearing down statues of Christopher Columbus. This is a brand new idea in United States race riot history of which we've got quite a lengthy version of it. No one in the 1960s or 70s or even the 80s would have thought that tearing down Columbus was the way to appease blacks. So this has been expressed in the starkest possible anti-white racial terms and this was yet again a new development. But uh, this, as I say, there's been a long decline in racial sanity in the United States. I've had my finger on the pulse of racial thinking, racial behavior in this country ever since 1990 as a somewhat full time job. And things have been sort of gradually going downhill. But on May 25th of 2020, things took a drastically rapid descent. In uh, Australia at the time of uh, these matters a couple of years ago, 
A movement also began here attacking statutes. Uh, as you know, Australia was settled uh, as a result of a British claim on Australia in 1770. Uh, attacks on statues of uh, James Cook, uh, attacks on uh, old governors, colonial governors. Uh, we suddenly discovered that one of our governors here, a Governor Macquarie, may have kept a slave. And uh, this triggered off various things. And there were perverted attempts to suggest that there's some, shall we say, parallel in Australia between the unfortunate conditions of our Aboriginal population uh, and American blacks. And of course, as you would well know, there is simply no uh, possible comparison. Uh, but this movement in Australia seemed to be very, very politically triggered. It couldn't be said to be a mass movement. It couldn't be said to be anything. It was a group of uh, activists, usually from the far left of politics, who did these things. Uh, is it the case in the United States too that uh, these influencer groups became heavily involved in this movement from anti-far to the Socialist Workers Party to whatever? How did this movement actually develop then on the ground? We have a mass phenomenon. How is it then manipulated? There's no doubt that uh, Antifa and a certain number of black radicals have been intimately involved in fomenting this kind of activity. But for the first time, it really took on a kind of popular character. I regret to say this, but in many of these mobs, and that's something else I should have said earlier, yet another new element of the riots this time was the number of whites who were involved. In the more peaceful aspects of the demonstrations, in de depending on the city, depending on the populace, you might find large numbers of whites out there brandishing signs that would say such things as white silence is violence, as if simply by remaining silent, white people are committing violence against blacks. What kind of foolishness is that? It's as if we have superpowers. Simply by saying nothing, we're committing violence against blacks. No, this is a new kind of insanity. But the numbers of people out there, black, and white, and in some cases, even Asians. This is something I never would have expected, and you cannot pin it on movements such as Antifa or any other far left parties. There was a certain aspect of this, a certain element among young people who've been to college. The more likely you are to have been to college, the more likely you are to believe this utterly crazy foolishness that white people are somehow personally responsible. Now, at the same time, there can be no doubt about it churches, media, universities, all expressed a pious solidarity for blacks who are protesting these things and whites who were expressing their own outrage at their fellow whites. In fact, one of the most remarkable declarations at the time was signed by, uh, as I recall, 800 professional health workers, or at least those who styled themselves as health workers. You'll recall at the time that we were all maintaining social distancing because of COVID. You and Australia were doing it really to beat the band. And people were advised to stay indoors, don't mix in large numbers, and certainly don't shout in each other's faces because this is <laughs> going to spread this vicious Chinese virus all around. Well, these health workers put out an official declaration saying, well, we should make an exception. We will make an exception for Black Lives Matters because that's more important than stopping COVID. Now, you cannot lay this at the feet of uh, Antifa or some kind of cabal of newspaper editors. Mm -hmm. There is a lot more going on. There has been a real poisoning of the minds of an enormous number of white churchmen, academics, intellectuals. And uh, this was, as I say, there was a process. This process was, was going on at a pretty good clip, but it took a terrible turn for the worse in May 25th of 2020. Now, I see certain signs of reversal. Uh, at the time, there was a great call to defund the police. And there would be elected officials in uh, the liberal cities, such as Seattle or Portland, in which they would say, well, OK, the problem, the problem of black crime isn't black criminals. It's policemen going into the neighborhoods and somehow provoking crime. I mean, there were people who would actually spout this kind of foolishness. Well, uh, any kind of backing off by the police in the United States invariably results in a huge increase in primarily black crime. And so even the looniest 
of these liberals in Seattle or in Portland, Oregon, have realized that, well, gosh, maybe we need the police after all. So <laughs> some of the really certifiably psychotic ideas that came out of this are beginning to wane. And, and this is an aspect of it from which we can draw a certain amount of hope. Most ordinary white people were completely outraged by what was going on. There, it was a minority to, to be sure, but it was a large enough minority for it to represent a kind of genuinely populist anti-white movement composed not just of non-whites, but of a considerable number of hopped up crazy white people. So it would be tempting to, to say, okay, this band of master manipulators had taken this occasion and whipped up a kind of hysteria. The hysteria was there to be whipped up. And so when the media and the churches, and the universities, all of them encouraged the idea that this was a righteous demonstration of black indignation, then there were plenty of people who were happy to go along. But could we anti-whiteism uh, links in a big tapestry, doesn't it? I mean, the trans movement to repudiate uh, the insane ideas uh, there, you're a Nazi. In fact, anything that counters this, um, let's say, woke narrative is Nazi. Um, yes. Now, we've spoken about the uh, riots that were triggered by the uh, death of uh, George Floyd, but the Capitol Hill, the so-called Capitol Hill riots, um, they also offer a wonderful uh, uh, point uh, for examining the psychosis uh, in the American uh, corporate media um, political establishment at the moment, because all those riots were allowed to go on, uh, as you said, cities burned, businesses looted, etc. But the American establishment is focused on a largely a bogus uh, event following uh, the de the defeat of Donald Trump. <laughs> at Capitol Hill, and I believe in America right now, they're televising the uh, the um, inquiry into the Capitol Hill riots. Now, that's an absolutely willful effort to ignore all that they, let's say, permitted to happen and, you know, detracting from the state of the economy in the mo at, at the moment. Well, that's wrong. You know. Uh, yes, well. Uh, there's a great deal to be said on that particular subject. Now, uh, I do not wish to downplay what happened on January 6th. The videos clearly show people fighting with the police, people who would ordinarily be very much on the side of the police, people breaking down barriers, breaking windows, and pushing their way into place where they were not wanted. Now, I don't condone that. I think it was a terrible thing. On the other hand, as you point out, now the media and the Democrats act as if this is the only riot that ever took place in American history. And I think it is incorrect to dismiss it and not call it a riot. This was an act of violence by a certain number of people. Now, for to then launch what turned out to be the largest law enforcement operation and manhunt in American history to track down every single one of the people who walked into that Capitol building, whereas those who during the Black Lives Matter riots, attacked police or set fire to buildings. Those people often have been let off with a slap on the wrist. And now people who are being charged with a kind of trespassing, but mm -hmm. there's a special kind of trespassing in the Capitol building, which can get you uh, time in jail of a kind that this kind of relentless prosecution of people, some of whom just wandered into the building after the building had been breached, no one was trying to stop them. And this utter double standard is well understood by millions and millions of Americans. Believe me, it's not gone unnoticed by ordinary white American that Americans, the, the events of January 6th are being treated in a completely, utterly different way. Another important point to make about this is that this was this has often been called an insurrection. Well, it was an utterly disorderly rabble. And it's also called a, an attack on democracy. 
These people were convinced that Donald Trump had legitimately won the election. They were defending democracy. It's unlikely that people would be attacking America and attacking democracy while waving hundreds and hundreds of American flags. Here, we're, we're supposed to be trying to overthrow the United States government while waving American flags. It was, as I say, a disorderly rabble that was utterly leaderless, and it caught the Capitol Police completely by surprise, and they went in, and they paraded around and hardly did any damage at all, and when they were told to get out, they got out. And to pretend that this is somehow a mortal threat to democracy is absolutely laughable. The reason, of course, why the Democrats have pounced on this and will never let it go. There are two reasons, really. One is the crowd was almost over what was overwhelmingly white. And so whenever white people get together in large numbers, the temptation on the left to say, well, this is white supremacy. Ipso facto, look at all those white people. They've got to be Nazis. Mm -hmm. And so this is repeatedly called a white supremacist insurrection, as if they had been marching through the halls of Congress saying, we want segregated schools, or we want blacks to sit in the back of the bus, or we want restrictive covenants so we can keep black people out of our neighborhood. Not a hint of this, not a hint of this. There is no evidence ever so what that people had any racial motive at all in being there. But not more than 24 hours after the January 6th event, there is President Joe Biden telling the world that these were white supremacists doing this. This is cuckoo. And perhaps you may recall the uh, uh, there was uh, the actual inauguration took place some weeks after that. They they mobilized 25,000 National Guardsmen to protect the inauguration against a completely bogus, utterly imagined, non-existent threat of white supremacist violence. The fact is, during the Civil War, the Confederate General Jubal Early was probing yes. the defenses of Washington. I believe this is in 1863. He was sent off with far fewer than 25,000 men. And uh, the idea that they had to have all of these people swarming all over the Capitol to make sure that President Joe Biden's inauguration was not disrupted by these wicked armed insurrectionists. Utterly, utterly. Cuckoo. Uh, but the, one, uh, the, the, the other sorry. point, the other point, let me let me just finish on the, on the question of the January 6th business. The Democrats are absolutely terrified of Donald Trump. They fear that he might be the next Republican nominee and might even win the election. Now, they are trying to pin these events on him. And this utterly ridiculous show trial, really, that they're putting on, they're calling it a congressional hearing. It's not a congressional hearing at all. They've already interviewed a thousand witnesses, and they have selected the portions of their video testimony that make Donald Trump sound potentially bad. And so they have selectively edited everything, and they're calling this a hearing? No, it's not a hearing at all. It's an utterly one-sided prosecutor's case against Donald Trump. And this is really worse than banana republics. It is utterly pathetic that the party in power should stoop to this kind of blatant propaganda. And I think many, many Americans see right through it. I was going to ask you, uh, one of the interesting things that I did note in some media at the time of the BLM riots was that uh, some of the uh, Negro folk who were speaking, some of the activists, were not integrationists. And, no, no, no. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, uh, they seem to think that uh, things were so bad for black uh, people in white society that uh, maybe it'd be far better off to have their own society. Um, have these people, in your estimation, gained any traction in the United States? Do they get any hearing? And if they do, how are they attacked? I wish they would get more traction. And right. in fact, the way you hear black academics talk about white people, you would think nothing would please them more for both peoples to go their own way. Now, there are blacks who in the past have talked about separation. None of them, I believe, really means it. The only one who ever met it was Marcus Garvey, who had a Back to Africa, a back to Africa movement. I think he really did believe it. Uh, his motto was, rise, you mighty people. He thought black people could really be turned into something, a powerful force for good and left themselves with proper leadership. They would build a wonderful society. It's too bad that he failed. Most of the blacks who talk about separation 
in their bones, I think they realize they're far better off living amongst us, trying to keep Whitey always on the hop, but benefiting from the kind of infra infrastructure that we provide to a society. You've probably heard of, uh, oh, our uh, black Muslim guy. Uh, oh, why can't I think of his name? Um, the Nation of Islam, um, uh, it, it'll come to me in a moment. Uh, for uh, years, Elijah Muhammad. Uh, it, it, well, Louis Elijah Farrell. Muhammad was the ori original one, uh, the, the, the fellow we, who's, who's running the show now. For years, he has been talking about separation. Well, he had something called the Million Man March on the Mall in Washington, D.C. And this is an occasion on which he had a huge, huge audience. And I was thinking, uh, uh, okay, now's your chance to talk about separation. You claim to be a separatist. No, he didn't talk about it at all. Not one bit. Uh, and it's uh, really irritating me. I can't think of the fellow's name. He's uh, you mean Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan. Of course. Of course. No, I beg your pardon. Uh, no, this was a, a, a mental lapse on my part. Louis Farrakhan. He's been talking about separation uh, in a quiet way. But when push comes to shove, no. He doesn't want it. And Patrice Cullors, she is one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. She is always speaking most insultingly about whites. Well, once all of this corporate money dropped into her coffers, she went on a real estate buying spree and she bought <laughs> nice houses. Uh, uh, oh, she's bought a man. Uh, her organization's bought a mansion in Los Angeles uh, and a headquarters mansion in in Canada. And one of the houses she bought personally is in Topanga Canyon in California. Well, Topanga mm -hmm. Canyon is one of the mm -hmm. whitest places in the United States. So even Patrice Colors, when she's got money to spend, is she going to uh, buy a nice place in the ghetto? No, she ends up wanting white neighborhoods because that's where she's safe and that's where she can live happily in nice in the midst of nice scenery. So. Many of these people, I believe, are charlatans and they are opportunists who are going to ride whatever personal benefit they can get right out of whatever movement they've started, thanks to the insane generosity of white corporations, which if you loot a Walmart and you burn down a Walmart in Minneapolis, what does uh, what does the company do? The Walmart promises to give $100 million to Black Lives Matter. The, this is a, a, mm -hmm. a form of insanity, again, that we've never seen before in the United States. It used to be that if you burn down something, you got punished for it. Now you get rewarded for it. But again, this is this has been a kind of overreaction of a sort that uh, I see as beginning to produce a backlash, even amongst the craziest parts of the United States. Nobody's talking about defunding the police anymore. And whenever this has come up for any kind of vote, the defund the police idea has been decisively beaten. I yeah. took some time to uh, examine some of the uh, comments that are passed against your very balanced and reasoned commentary. Uh, powerful organisations like the ADL or the Southern Poverty Law Centre, mm -hmm. of course. And it's this uh, twisted uh, narrative of linkages and references and and uh, and so on. Um, I'll ask two, two interrelated questions. What purpose do you think these organisations serve? And uh, secondly, what result do they think they're going to get out of the untruthful propaganda that they enunciate? Well, uh, I spent uh, several hours in deep and candid conversation with a person who will remain unnamed, uh, mm. whose name might actually be known to people in Australia who pay attention to this watchdog anti-racism movement. And uh, I, I believe that this person genuinely thinks that any kind of racial consciousness, but particularly white racial consciousness, will lead to the subjugation of people of other races. And they love to talk about slavery and colonization and Jim Crow. I am not one, I am not one to seek to find nefarious motives in the actions of others. I'm often accused of naivete. I believe, however, that very few people get up in the morning and spit on their hands and uh, roll up their sleeves and say, OK, what am I going to do to try to exterminate white people today or end the white race? People don't think in those terms. For example, when Angela Merkel decided to let in, let in a million and a half of these 
Muslims, young Muslim men into Germany. Did she do this because she hates Germany? Because she wants to destroy Germans? No, I don't think she did. If she hated Germany and if she wanted to destroy Germany, she might have done those things, but those were not her reasons. I think she knew, of course, that the press was going to pat her on the head and say, there, there, what a wonderful person. At the same time, she probably thought, well, these people are very badly off where they are. They will live, they will live better lives if we are generous to them. And she probably thought also, we are not, our birth rates are going down. We will train these people to be good uh, automobile technicians and uh, I don't know, accountants and doctors. She probably had motives of that kind. Now, I've never met Angela Merkel. I have no idea what she really thinks, but that is to me a more logical explanation of her terrible disservice to her own country rather than some kind of outright malicious hatred of her own people. Now, in the United States, the people who speak as if they hate whites, for many of them, you could describe it almost as a twisted sort of white supremacy. When people say white violence, white silence is violence. They're ascribing to whites a kind of superpower. All we have to do is refrain from speaking and these poor meat puppet automaton black people start shooting each other. What does that say about mm -hmm. black people? It suggests that whites, unless they completely reorient their own mentality, completely purge their minds mm -hmm. of every impure thought, all the blacks and non-whites in the United States are going to fail, really. I mean, we don't have that kind of power. Also, when they set themselves up as the arbiters of virtue and insult people like me, they are in effect saying, these other white people are the only people that matter. These white people who are wrong, who are haters, who are bigots, they are our real enemies because it is a battle among white people. It's white people that will determine the destiny of this country. We're on the good side and then the bad whites are on the bad side. They, pour, they, pay, they pay more attention to us than the alleged benefactors of their goodwill. So once again, there is a twisted kind of recognition that the people who matter in this country are white people and it's up to them to make everybody, everything better for everybody else. So what does the, well, the ADL, of course, uh, they have a, a, a particular Jewish slant on this, but the Jewishness of their slant is not that much different as a practical matter from a group like the Southern Poverty Law Center or the mainstream American mm. churches or the institutions uh, such yeah, as uh, mm. uh, the, the media. Uh, the fact mm. that the ADL is interested in the effect this may have on support for Israel or the interests of Jews per se. As a practical matter, their agenda doesn't differ all that much, aside from foreign policy, from uh, the, the faculty of Harvard or from uh, the policies of the Presbyterian Church. This attitude of considering whites as not only so powerful that their thoughts alone can enchain blacks, and the idea that people like me are potentially so destructive that I cannot even be debated with. I have to be thrown off of YouTube, kicked out of Twitter, kicked off of Facebook. This is a kind of high praise when you think about it. Nobody's the least bit worried about having to try to silence any of these black nincompoops. They can spot all the nonsense they like. Everybody deep down understands nobody's going to believe them. But somebody might believe someone like uh, Mr. Salem or Jared Taylor. It's a kind of a high praise, much as I wish they did not treat me this way, of course. But it's an admission that what really matters in the United States is what white people think and not what anybody else thinks. Uh, I'd ask you a question when you mention people like Angela Merkel and so forth. I, you're familiar naturally with the well-known US commentator Noam Chomsky. Yes. And uh, Chomsky uh, said at one point that uh, uh, the corporate interest viewed uh, human beings as interchangeable cogs in a huge industrial machine and that uh, this type of system, he said, doesn't really care if you're black or white or if you're another race or nationality. It's simply a matter of what's convenient at the time in replacing you. Uh, 
for some particular industrial or other purpose. It was an amazing reference that a lot of the uh, the left, you'd imagine Mr. Chomsky's a great hero of this, but uh, as a public intellectual, I suppose he's told a particular truth. Have any of these folks, by your estimation, ever seen the obvious that uh, uh, docile labour uh, is a new slave system and that they're actually creating a new slavery in the United States or anywhere else for that matter? Leftists, leftists to a large degree will take that view. They see the struggle as one of a struggle of classes, the workers yes. against the bosses. Indeed. And they have this silly idea that if only the black workers and the white workers and the Hispanic workers and the Asian workers could all join yes. hands, they could rise up against the bosses. And somehow these clever manipulative bosses have set the blacks against the whites, et cetera, as if racial differences and racial hostility would just absolutely disappear if we did not have this capitalist system. There is a goofy sort of leftist view that racism comes from capitalism. And until we abolish capitalism, yeah. then there's going to be racism. Well, good luck yeah. with that. The idea yeah. that the Cubans didn't have didn't have racial differences. Racism, that's right. Well. No, it, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. Racism or racial conflict and hostility is inherent to the human condition and to somehow yeah. think that it is dependent on a particular form of economic organization that's what's going to and by changing the economic form of organization we're going to solve this problem of race it's it's completely screwy but someone like noam chomsky yes he has a particular view of things but at the same time some of the lefties some of the lefties will tell you that importing cheap mexican labor for example that's mm -hmm. not good for the american working class uh, our bernie sanders uh, the most leftist of our major mm -hmm. presidential candidates the last time around he used to be quite forthright about this and it's obvious when you think about it when you import Absolutely. cheap labor who suffers most? It's the people Works. who are performing mm. those same jobs now, mostly black and most Hispanics who are already here. It's pretty obvious. And a leftist, if he really mm. believes in trying to improve the lot of working people, should be first in line to be saying these things. Well, wow. yes. But these sure. days, if you say anything that would prevent large numbers of non-whites from pouring into the country and getting mm. jobs or going on welfare, then that's racist even if at the same time it's taking the food out of the mouths of working class families in the United States. That is the power that race has now. It has completely overthrown any kind of irrational leftist argument on how to prove working conditions. Okay, can I ask you, um, it's something I've often thought that anti-racism is almost a, a civic religion. And uh, I take it you would agree with that idea? Yes, it is based on a matter of pure faith. And I, I would take it even further. Of course, in the United States and in Australia as well, it's taboo to talk about racial differences in average ability, particularly average IQ. I consider this to be one of the great intellectual failings in all of human history. For the United States to deliberately ignore the mountains of evidence that suggests that it is impossible to expect, expect blacks to perform at the same level as whites. It's simply impossible. And then to turn around and say they can perform at that level. And the only reason they don't is because of white maliciousness, white wickedness, past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. You have to turn the society upside down, inside out, in order to change everything about it in the hope of trying to achieve something that's impossible. Now, People often talk about the fate of Galileo and uh, the people who were put mm -hmm. to death because they insisted mm -hmm. on telling the world evidence is overwhelming. It's not the sun that rotates around the earth. The earth rotates around the sun. Get this straight. Well, and we look back and we laugh at the bigoted Catholic church that refuse to look at the evidence. But in their daily mm -hmm. lives, the fact of believing in a geocentric universe did not change people's lives. It didn't change them. It didn't change their moral view of what the world should be about, how society should be structured. But in this case, the failure across the board in the United States for people to recognize that the races have different outcomes because the races are different. This oppresses and distorts and poisons 
every aspect of life in the United States. And for that reason, I mean, you can talk about differences in religious view. Well, religion mm. is not a subject of, of debate of the normal kind. But or you could talk about maybe the tulip craze in uh, in in Holland. All of the crazy things that happened because people had irrational expectations about tulips. All of this pales to nothingness compared to the folly that Americans have right or have wreaked on their own society due to this intellectual failing. And it's not merely an intellectual failing, of course. It's a kind of intellectual bullying in which a nation that prides itself on freedom of speech and uh, speaking up, uh, what a joke that is. There are certain things in which mm. you are, you mm. have less freedom of speech in the United States than people did under the old Soviet Union. So uh, this, this is, again, this inability to recognize the significance of racial differences. And again, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming compared to trying to understand the arguments for a Copernican system or a, a heliocentric mm. system. And in mm. fact, if you look at the sun, you know, and you, you say, we, we're not moving. It's very easy to think that we that the, the sun course, uh, logic. moves around us. Mm. And so mm. compared to understanding, well, that's not the way it works. Understanding racial differences is trivial. Anyone with two eyes in his head and an IQ of more than a fried egg is going to look around the United States and think about the last 500 years. They will obviously the races aren't equal. And in, then in our, to suppress this is insanity. In the public media dialogue in Australia, we never hear you've indicated that there's a big turnaround of opinion in America amongst uh, Americans of European descent as to what's actually occurred in your country. But uh, without even naming these people, all we ever hear in Australia are oddballs, uh, fruity people, strange individuals who are supposed to represent white folks in America. Yes. And the media holds up somebody who's used a firearm, who's done some outrage. That's all we ever hear. And yes. we hear that there are these ideologies that are festering away and we need the security apparatus. But then oddly, we sometimes even find out that some of these people are working for these security apparatus. Yes. But uh, be that as it may, that's all we ever hear. Um, would you offer an opinion as to why it is or how it is that legitimate American voices are not heard? It's for the same reason they're rarely heard in the United States. Your media, your media are just as twisted, just as committed mm -hmm. to this utterly crazy notion of racial egalitarianism as ours is. Your leaders, your churches, you are in exactly the same boat as we. And how this happened in Western Europe, North America, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, we could talk at great length as to why it was that from societies that had a reasonably healthy attitude towards race 100 years ago, how we have stood reality on its head and have now become so apologetic, so unwilling to defend our own rights and our own heritage. That's a very long story. And uh, I'm not sure I can tell it accurately. I've heard many attempted explanations. None is entirely satisfactory me for, to me either singly or in combination. But uh, there is no question that the ruling media, all of the institutions have swallowed this same line of baloney. And that is why if the Australian media is going to explain, well, this fellow in Buffalo, I'm sure he was big news in Australia. Oh, yes. Peyton, Peyton Gendron, or yes. Gendron fellow, who went into a black neighborhood and I believe he, he murdered uh, 10 people. Yes, he did. Mm. Yes, well, uh, you heard an awful lot about that. And he was portrayed as this utter lunatic or this hater, mm. this uh, mm. untwisted white supremacist uh, who was radicalized on the internet. And the conclusion always is, to the extent that they're even aware of someone like me, the conclusion is, OK, we've got to purge the Internet of any kind of idea that would result in that kind of activity. Now, the media in Australia, no more than the United States, is going to mm -hmm. ask someone like me to say, well, wait a minute, what's the story on this great replacement 
that Gendron was talking about. Why is it that he would do such a thing, horrible though it may be? Is there any kind of logical or moral explanation as to what he did? Mm -hmm. You could ask mm -hmm. the same question about Branton mm -hmm. Tarrant in New Zealand. Why did he do what he did? Well, people don't even ask that question. Invariably, mm -hmm. the reaction is, look at the horror that these ideas provoke. These ideas must be banned. These ideas are gone for good. Mm -hmm. Whereas, mm -hmm. A point that I would like to make is let us imagine that I were a real climate change devotee. I was convinced that we were destroying the planet and I propagandized uh, endlessly and actively and persuasively on the idea of reducing the carbon footprint. And somebody reads what I say about this and then goes into the executive floor of Exxon Mobil and starts shooting up every executive he can find. Does that mean my ideas were wrong? No, it doesn't mean my ideas were wrong. There are many, many ideas, class struggle, for example, or abortion rights. Many mm. ideas have given rise to horrible acts. People sometimes go crazy and do violent things in the name of all kinds of things. But it is only those questions that have to do with the survival of whites or the maintenance of white majorities, those ideas are never examined in any kind of objectivity apart from the occasional events in which someone like Branton Tarrant or Peyton Gendron goes out and shoots somebody. That is mm -hmm. all that mm -hmm. matters. And of course, it's because they do not want to examine our ideas. So, so far from the Australian media calling on someone like me to explain, well, well, why would someone do that? No, they would pretend I never existed. Or if they ever talked about the ideas behind it, they would drag out some snaggletooth guy with a swastika tattoo in the middle of his forehead. <laughs> and yes, and this is, you know, here you are, here you are, Nazism. Yeah. No, it's crazy. It's because mm. they are utterly blinded to any explanation for white discontent, utterly blinded. The only well, motive that they can attribute to us is hate. Hate. Let me ask you a prognosticator's question, a crystal baller, a soothsayer's mm. question. Um, what do you actually think the future of the United States is? Do you think the United States as a country may disappear in the 20... Uh, where do you think it will go? I think it is possible that the United States could stumble off, stumble along for quite a few more decades. It could de degenerate into a kind of Brazilianization in which there is a large underclass of blacks and Hispanics. And then there's the kind of a ruling class of whites and Asians and a few token uh, blacks and Hispanics. Uh, and uh, these people will live in their gated communities and they'll helicopter to their gated schools and their gated pool clubs. I can imagine a kind of very stratified society of that kind in which there's just a uh, sort of bubbling malaise and ungovernability. I could imagine something going on in that direction for some decades. I hope it doesn't happen that way. To me, the only real solution that we should be looking for is some form of separation. Obviously, it would have to be along racial lines for it to be separation that really made sense. But it could even be along political lines. If you separated the United States into chunks where people voted for Donald Trump and into the chunks where people voted for Joseph Biden, Americans would be much, much happier. We wouldn't have to mess with the other people who think the other way. And, and, uh, yeah. Yes, Very those good. of us, those of us who did vote for Donald Trump, overwhelmingly white, but they don't have to be all white. I'd settle for I'm a su super majority of whites in living in a self-consciously conservative or nationalist and ultimately uh, a way that values European civilization. Now, I, I re yeah. yes, go ahead, please. Oh, no, 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 please, please finish what you're going to say, please. Well, uh, I have always advocated freedom of association, complete freedom of association, when people are left entirely to their own devices. There are hardly any, even of the staunchest, most fire-breathing liberals who choose to live this multiracial, multi-culty life that they claim is going to be such a great strength of the United States. If you ask even the most blinkered liberal to name a single non-white neighborhood he'd like to live in, he's going to come up dry.
Well, a non, well, a non-white <laughs> school he'd like to send his children to. Hey, come on, just, name just one. They're not going to come up with one. There's a huge amount of hypocrisy, a huge amount of hypocrisy. So uh, how we actually get white people, even liberals, to understand their true motives and the things they care about most when it comes to where they're going to live, who their children will marry, where their children will go to school, as the great Joe Sobrin said, in yeah. their mating and migratory habits, liberals are hardly distinguishable from members of the Ku Klux Klan. They all, <laughs> they all act and behave in the same way. And another one of uh, Joe Sobrin's bon mots was the purpose of a college education in the United States is to give you the right attitude towards the minorities and the means to live as far away from them as possible. <laughs> That's very smart. Yeah, very good. He's a very, very smart good. guy, that Joe Sobel. Yeah. There's a um, lot of truth to this, a lot of truth to it. So uh, the trick is to get white people to really get in touch with their feelings, so to speak. Back in the hippie era, you know, we were all trying to get in touch with our feelings. Ball. White people need to get in touch with their true feelings as white people and realize, whew, yes, we really are happy, happier among people like ourselves, and let's stop pretending otherwise. Uh, I realize that your time is very valuable and uh, and so on, and uh, obviously you've done most of the talking, and there's a very good reason for that. Yeah. No, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's simply because your message is not heard by and large by patriotic people in Australia and nationalist-minded people in Australia. And uh, it's a marvellous introduction to them that they now actually hear your words because I, I have seen you quoted, your name mentioned in vain uh, in the Australian press over the last many years. And you're usually a terrible footnote to an article written by a very liberally minded person who's just followed the philosophy that uh, you've enunciated. But um, if I may uh, uh, ask you a effectively concluding question. Um, have you conceived your particular struggle uh, all the way along as a uh, subcultural, he counter-hegemonic uh, struggle? I know you're not a, a political activist per se. Um, do you uh, consider that uh, you've managed to have a real impact on the discourse amongst those Americans who may wish to act in some constructive way upon your thoughts? Do you believe you've done that? Emphasis on constructive. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I will tell you this. 30 years ago, when I started American Renaissance, if you had told me that uh, I would be excluded from practically every means of communication with the public and that the ideas that I were I was trying that I was proposing to espouse were still 30 years later going to be excluded from the national conversation. I might not have started American Renaissance. I will freely <laughs> tell you that I had much more optimistic ideas about what could be achieved. After all, what we say and what we think is reasonable. It's moral. It is in conformity with everything we know about human nature, about history, and what we propose, the survival of our own people and a preference for our own people is utterly morally unimpeachable. I mm -hmm. was convinced that because of this, these ideas could be injected into the public conversation in the United States in a way that would be successful. Well, I haven't been successful in that sense. At the same time, it is very gratifying to know how many white Americans have listened to what I have said and whose views have changed. Clearly, in order for us to affect some kind of political change in the United States or in Australia or any part of Western Europe in a way that ensures the survival of our people, more people have to agree with us. Now, I wish I'd been more successful in persuading more people to agree with us. But after 30 years of this, I think that I will be able to go to my grave at least knowing that I have done my duty to my ancestors, and I have met an obligation to my descendants to try to build a world in which my ancestors are given the credit that they so eminently deserve and that my descendants will live in a society that values both them and their traditions and all of those who went before. So although I have been much less successful 
than I certainly hoped to be. I feel as though I have done my duty and I can go to my grave satisfied in that respect. And at the same time, I would not wish to downplay the effect that I think I and others like me have had. When I first started this back in 1990, there was practically no one else speaking about these things. Now in the United States, there are dozens, scores of websites, publishing houses, people who are putting memes together, doing podcasts, videos. There's a real underground movement. When I started this, in order to get some kind of realistic assessment of race in the United States, you had to grope in the dusty corners of university libraries or right off to strange P.O. boxes in Olathe, Kansas to get some kind of information. Now, information of this kind is just a few clicks away. I am convinced that white people are not going to walk off the face of history. There's still 135 million of us in the United States. We're not going to disappear. In what form we will take our destiny in our own hands, I do not know, but I'm convinced that we will do so. Can, can I just ask you, uh, Jared, has there ever been a president as egregious as Joe Biden in your living memory? I mean, he makes, um, uh, he makes- Ronald uh, Reagan look intelligent? Uh, I was gonna say, Richard Nixon look honest, you know? No, no, no. <laughs> Jo <laughs> Joseph Biden is a the gift who keeps giving to the Republicans. Uh, there's no qu there's no question about it. And the Democrats are just in the worst sort of tizzy as to who they're going to run in the next election. Kamala Harris, that joke, Joe Biden, this senile old goof. No, uh, they are facing a terrible, terrible dilemma. And the midterm elections uh, coming up later this year, I suspect it'll be a real bloodbath of Democrats and they're preparing for it. But Joe Biden, you see, we have this strange, strange political system in which we have these, these odd combinations of coalitions that have to come together to produce a nominee. And then we have a general election in which uh, we, we end up, ended up with two awfully old guys trying to become president of the United States. No, we do have a system, much as Americans brag about democracy and uh, here they're this great shining light and example of the world. We have an utterly crazy political system that throws up a absolute, I don't know, scandalous, shameful guy, this doddering <laughs> Joseph Biden. No, uh, but of course, as I say, he's a great gift. He's a great gift to the Republicans. Thank yeah, thank you. Can I just ask you, you one last question? Yeah. Um, and there's a documentary that is uh, causing a, a hell of a lot of controversy at the moment called What is a Woman? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Are you aware of it? Yes, I am. Yes, I I've seen the trailer for it. Uh, oh, uh, well, we're actually going to have a screen. We're showing it today for our entertainment. We have oh. a conference today and uh, I Excellent. have to see this myself. Anything like this, I have to see it. <laughs> you know, okay. what, what are your uh, thoughts on how this, I mean, I never would have thought in all my life that we could come to a point where the, uh, defining what a woman is could become a prosecutable manner. I know it is uh, in uh, Canada. What, well, what, what's this madness? You know, I believe, I believe that this kind of madness did start with race. It started because we were all trained to believe something that is clearly untrue and when examined is preposterous. On the other hand, if you live in Minnesota or you live in Maine or you live in New Hampshire, or I'm sure there are parts of Australia where you can live, and if all you know about black people or Aborigines is what you read about them in Newsweek or some liberal magazine, you might be prepared to think, well, you know, the trouble with these folks is they've just been mistreated. And if we just treat them right, they'll be just like white people. This is not a completely preposterous notion if you have never met any or you've met a select uh, group that was well behaved and civilized. So. It is understandable that people who have a limited experience of blacks or people of other races might say, okay, we must integrate. We must treat these people correctly. We must change the way we've treated them. The fact is everybody has a mother. Most people, a lot of people have sisters for heaven's sake. 
and then somehow to believe that temperamentally and practically biologically and in terms of their sexual appetites and the things that interest them, their levels of aggression, that we're just essentially interchangeable. If racial egalitarianism is preposterous, this is preposterous on stilts. But, uh, uh, but perhaps, perhaps I'm mistaken, but I do believe that the capacity to believe things as utterly crazy as this has been implanted, at least in Americans, beginning with the idea that the races are basically interchangeable. If, you can, if you're prepared to believe that, there are a number of crazy things you're prepared to believe, such as that white silence is violence, but then to believe that, women, uh, that, that men can have babies or to refer <laughs> to breastfeeding, you know, we can't talk about breastfeeding that's chest feeding now for heaven's sake yeah, good no no th but fortunately it has gotten to the point where the left has so overplayed its hands the absurdity of, of all this has begun so unmistakable that i believe that the scales are falling from more and more people's eyes but we'll see no it is really a march of extraordinary folly that cannot end well and when enough people, enough people see the truth and start abandoning ship, I think there is going to be a complete collapse of some of these illusions. I'd like to, if I may, uh, wish you the absolute best uh, in your endeavours. I can hear from behind me, I'm about to get invaded here by uh, a number of people for this meeting and our conversation won't be able to proceed. But uh, it's been an enormous pleasure uh, to speak with you this morning, our time. And uh, I hope that at some point of time I can be of some service to you uh, in America commenting on the madness that we have here. Well, so, I, must, I must interview you because we yeah, don't get I, nearly enough news about Australia as we well, should. Well, always, always remember this. We torture the English language in a way that you'll find greatly entertaining. And, uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to thank you very much and I must myself now adjourn. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank, thank you, you very much. Sure.